we are going to move into our program this morning. Um, I don't know if Spencer, you want to get our webinar kicked off here. So we are doing, this is our first attempt at a virtual hybrid panel for you guys in our brand new facility. It's exciting, right? Check it out. Yes. So yes, please give them an applause. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're talking this morning, if you hadn't heard, we're talking this morning about electrification. And I want to just take a second to talk about like what does that mean exactly, right? What, when we say electrification, what are we talking about? We're talking about homes uh, becoming non-gas using entities, right? So taking a home that maybe has a natural gas stove, a natural gas water heater, gas heater, and, and converting those to only using electric appliances or systems in the building. So when we're talking about electrification, or if we say electrification, I want to make sure you know exactly what we're talking about. Or maybe it's not an existing building, maybe it's a brand new building, and they're building a brand new building with no gas service, no natural gas service whatsoever. It's only electric using. Okay, so I just want to set the stage here for that. Um, we know it's a very technical topic, but we think it's so important for us in the real estate industry to understand what is happening right now in the world of electrification that we made this a main meeting topic for all of you. We want to make sure you have this critical information in order to be able to do your business and to disseminate this information to the clients that you work with every single day when you're selling a home, right? How many of you have clients who are like, don't sell me a house unless there's a gas stove? Okay, every hand up, right? Every single hand up. We all know about that. Okay, so we want to make sure you understand what's coming at us. What's coming at us because we um, are in the real estate industry? What's coming at us because we're in housing? What's coming at us because we are in the state of California? What's coming at us because we're in the city of Sacramento, county of Sacramento? And that's who we've brought together for you today. Um, from our, our government affairs team on our panel, we're going to have our own Aaron Teague. From the city of Sacramento, the climate action lead, Jennifer Venema. From the county of Sacramento, the principal planner in the Office of Planning and Environmental Review, Todd Smith. From SMUD, the government affairs manager, Steve Johns. And, and we really, these, these are very busy folks, so we certainly appreciate them. We certainly appreciate all of you taking the time to be with us here this morning. The goal of our conversation today is so that we can all have a discussion about how the policy around electrification is being developed and changing. We want to make sure you understand the information so that you can go out and do your business every day. Because we're doing this brand new format, hybrid, live, virtual, we're going to hold off on questions, but we did get feedback from our members and our association about the kinds of things that people are talking about, so we have questions prepared for our panelists already. Um, if you do have questions as we go through the presentation this morning, come check in with Aaron or Sam, also on the government affairs team, after the meeting. Give them your card and they will follow up with you and get you answers to any other questions you may have. Let's get jumped into our conversation here. Aaron, do you want to come up? Okay. So our first question for Aaron is how the heck did we get here? How, how and why are we talking about electrification? Why are our local governments creating policies around electrification? Great, thank you, Kelly. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna try to make this part quick, but I want you to kind of take, we're gonna go back in time a little bit to figure out how this group got to be dealing with um, electrification policy in their local um, positions. I think it's really important that we highlight a few of these pieces so we're all, like Kelly mentioned, we're all working off the same information on why local jurisdictions and utilities are focusing on policies regarding home electrification. This is really driven at the local level is as a response to state policy and state mandates. So again, I'm gonna go back in time a little bit with the passage of AB 32, the California Global Warming Solutions Act in, 20, in 2006, really set the stage for California's transition 
to sustainable low carbon future. This legislation created the regulatory regime to take comprehensive long-term approach to improving energy efficiency, expand the use of renewable energy resources and cleaner transportation fuels and technologies and reduce waste. From AB 32, the state legislature then passed several other bills giving state agencies the authority to put the regulatory elements in place. So if we take a step back, AB 32, 32 was that big, bold idea. And then the legislation that followed are those pieces in order to implement those big ideas. And I'm, I'm going to go through, again, hang in there with me. Um, it's going to be a few, it's going to be a little bit legislation heavy for a minute. Um, a few of the big ones that I want to run through. In 2015, California set ambitious goals to achieve statewide cumulative doubling energy efficiency savings and demand reductions in electricity and natural gas and usage relative to 2015 estimates by January 2030. Then SB 350 codified that goal and directed the California Energy Commission to set annual targets to accomplish this goal and authorize the California Public Utilities Commission to pursue market transformation programs to achieve deeper energy efficiencies. So this is where we saw, again, big bold idea on the policy level, then giving the different agencies the authority to control the mechanisms that they oversee. And then this is where we start to see those energy efficiency programs. We start to see a market transfer shift. I, I think we can all, and a, a really great example of that market transformation shift is uh, walking in our, our panelists, I don't think have seen our hallway of light bulbs that Carl has, but that LED transformation that we saw, that's how we influence the market on that piece. Then AB 802 in 2015 st started the requirement for utilities to maintain energy usage records for all buildings and provide energy usage data to the owner and directed the California Energy Commission to adopt regulations providing for the collection and public disclosure of building energy benchmarking information. I'm almost there. And then in 2016, SB 32, they like to keep you know, the numbers the same so we can all follow along, establish a new statewide greenhouse gas emissions reduction target of 40% below the 1990 levels by 2030. So we're starting to see a real repetition of the numbers. We've got a 2030 benchmark, and then how many of you have heard uh, zero carbon by 20, uh, 2045? Hands, everybody's heard it. So in so many meetings, these policy conversations, this number 2045 keeps rolling around and is used as a benchmark. And this comes from two key state directives. SB 100, where it mandated that all states' renewable portfolio standard be 100% of all retail electricity sales be provided by a renewable energy and zero carbon resource, which is why Smud is a great person to have on today. And then in addition to this, I'm sure you all remember when Governor Jerry Brown made the executive order that called for a statewide carbon neutrality by 2045. So they were seeing this consistency of numbers. So now the state is going even further. It's not just our buildings, but last fall, Governor Newsom passed an executive order that all new sales and purchases of lightweight vehicles and trucks be zero emission by 2035. On top of that, the state is advancing carbon neutrality through its regulatory process as state building codes become more and more ambitious. So all, all of this pulled together, what does this all mean and how does it get us here today? These are big steps that local jurisdictions need to take in order to hit these carbon zero deadlines. So that's why we've brought uh, our team here today because they're the ones that are actually crafting these policies at the local level and how we're gonna implement that in our region and what it's gonna mean for your business. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Kelly um, and that, that concludes my heavy duty remarks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Erin. So the state is requiring us at the local level to get our greenhouse gas emissions down in a nutshell, right? So these are requirements being passed down from the state to our local municipalities. So let's talk about how our local people and organizations are handling these requirements coming down from the state. That's why we have our wonderful city, county, and our local partner SMUD here so they can talk to us about what they're doing. So for our guests, for our panelists, um, can you talk in your respective organizations, please, 
Uh, wh where are you in the conversation about electrification? What are the specific goals that you have? And what is your timeline? Jennifer, why don't we start with you? Absolutely. Can you hear me all right there? Wonderful. Thank you so much for having us today. Really excited for this conversation and appreciate the opportunity to just check in with you all. So I think that, that context really helps to set the stage. This is funneling down and now at the local level, we're trying to figure out how to put this into play. Really good news is that we've had a collaborative effort to help us figure out how to translate this locally. And I really want to commend David Tanner. He was one of several commissioners that served on a task force Mayor Daryl Steinberg convened back in 2018, the Mayor's Commission on Climate Change. So David, along with many others from government and private sector came together just to do this, advise the city and that's the city of West Sacramento and city of Sacramento, how to achieve these goals. And so they did give us recommendations on electrification to require electrification for new buildings and to work towards 25% of existing buildings to be converted by 2030. And so what we've done since then, that process wrapped up in summer of last year, city council for us and city of Sacramento has prioritized these efforts and told us to get started. So we've been busy over the last year, first off developing an ordinance for new buildings to be all electric, which goes into effect in 2023. And what we're also working on is kicking off a strategy to plan for how we do this in the existing building side. So those are the two ways we're looking at electrification. Of most concern to the group here is really that strategy we'll be developing for the existing building sector, which hasn't started yet. And in the meantime, to try and provide the orienting framework for all of this, the city is also developing a climate action plan, just like the county. Now that draft will be released in November of this year, and it's going to pull for these recommendations at a high level that we then are going to work through as we develop this strategy for existing buildings. So two flags to keep on everyone's radar, which will be coming out in the draft, and that then we wanna engage you on over this next year to figure out how it works is where existing buildings will be recommending to look at an ordinance that requires switching equipment to electric at the time of replacement. So not at attaching this to the time of sale and also calling for working with the association and other partners to develop a voluntary listing program or some other sort of incentive. So these are two key things we'd like to work on with you all that we're going to be further developing and trying to define through that existing building strategy. So I think that summarizes where we are at the city side. Thank you, Jennifer. We appreciate that synopsis of all the hard work going on at the city around electrification. Todd, why don't you go next and tell us um, what's going on at the county level? Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, Kelly and Aaron for the introductory remarks. I, I really appreciate you setting the stage that way. And and just so everybody understands you know, the jurisdictional boundaries here, when, when I'm representing Sacramento County, it is just the unincorporated area. So not any of the incorporated cities, uh, just the unincorporated county. And so for us, the, uh, the county's climate action plan, uh, there's what's called an inventory of greenhouse gas emissions by various sectors and the energy sector in the unincorporated county between residential energy and commercial energy is uh, just a little bit over 40 percent so residential is 25 commercial is 18. so it's a big portion of our greenhouse gas emissions and a lot of that comes from uh, natural gas usage and so <clears throat> we um, i also want to highlight 
what you mentioned, uh, Kelly, the 2045 carbon neutrality target, uh, that's a statewide target. Uh, the County Board of Supervisors has uh, adopted a climate emergency declaration back in December of last year that is calling for a transition to carbon neutrality 15 years earlier than 2045. So we're looking at a 2030 goal. And so that's a very ambitious goal, very aggressive, very difficult. And so we've been uh, as staff hearing a lot from uh, environmental interest groups as we've developed the climate action plan. And uh, initially they were pushing for uh, a point of sale requirement to require full electrification of residential uh, homes at a point of sale. Um, we have tried to push back uh, a bit to call out some of the concerns that we've heard over the last several years uh, with prior representatives from the Association of Realtors. Uh, where we've landed right now in our, our public draft cap, which is out for review until uh, the end of this week, is a point of sale requirement for um, mixed fuel single family homes, so that's both natural gas and electric, to upgrade a minimum of one natural gas appliance or piece of equipment to an electrically powered equivalent or to upgrade an electrical panel or branch circuit that would support a future uh, electrical appliance uh, upgrade in the future. And so in addition to that, we're also looking at uh, partnering with local utilities to uh, increase participation in residential retrofit programs. Um, and I know that uh, Aaron has provided us a comment letter uh, highlighting a number of the concerns that the association has with this point of sale requirement. And I'm not gonna go through all of that today, but just wanna give you a context. That's where we're at on our climate action plan at the moment. Um, we are having a planning commission hearing on the public draft uh, toward the end of this month. Uh, our comment period closes on October 8th. And following that planning commission hearing, we will make any necessary revisions uh, that the, the Planning Commission recommends, uh, and obviously any comments that are coming in up until that date will be provided to the Commission for their consideration as well. After the Planning Commission, our next step would likely be on to the Board of Supervisors for final consideration. Um, at this point, that's not likely to happen until early next year. Okay, thank you, Todd, for those comments. We appreciate it, and certainly we know the county's working hard to help us meet the state mandated goals. Um, why don't we also go to Steve and, and you can talk a little bit about what's happening at the SMUD level. Yes, great, good morning. Um, you know, well, SMUD is a municipal utility district, which is an independent government agency. We don't have the same uh, regulatory authority of the city and the county. Um, however, our board of directors, which are elected, uh, have recognized publicly that we're facing a climate crisis and must, much, must, we must take action as have the Board of Supervisors and the Sacramento City Council. We support the electrification efforts of the city and the county. It's a key measure in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And it's especially effective here in Sacramento County because SMUD's energy is so much cleaner than in other areas. <clears throat> as many of I'm sure your membership knows, uh, we've been a leader in clean energy and carbon reduction for decades. In 2010, we were the first utility in California to meet 20% uh, of our energy load, re renewable energy. And uh, even today, we're one of the cleanest utilities in the nation with 50% of our energy being carbon free. And of that, uh, more than a third of it is renewable. So earlier this year, our board of directors adopted SMUD's clean energy vision. And we're committed to eliminating 100% of our greenhouse gas emissions from our electric generation by the end of the decade. This is the most ambitious goal of any utility in the United States. And so with that, we're working on a variety of things internally to make sure that we can meet this goal. And, but at the same time, we've set one of our objectives as keeping rates below the rate of inflation. And I could talk a little bit more about that later, but our rates are not expected to increase, or at least we're, we're using that as sort of one of our uh, bookends to guide us to our 2030 goal. In support of you know, the customers out there who are choosing to go to electric, all electric or that will be uh, moving into an electric environment, all electric environment in the future. SMUD has a variety of incentives and rebates for our customers so they can shift their appliances and systems over in that direction. 
Thank you, Steve, for that overview. We appreciate it and all the work that SMUD does in our community. I want to uh, go back, if we can, to um, something that Todd brought up, and, and it's, at least in our world, it's a bit of a four-letter word, is that point of sale, right? So just so that we're all on the same playing field, when we say point of sale, what we're talking about here is a, a mandated um, condition of a property before they will let you close your escrow. Right, so it's the city or the county or the state or the federal government saying this has to happen before you're allowed to close your escrow. And so when we go back just a second and we talk about, Todd said, you know, originally they wanted full electrification of a home to be a requirement at point of sale. Can you guys imagine what that would do to your escrows, first of all? But now he's saying, okay, let's go back. Right now, what's in the county's plan is a point of sale requirement to change out one appliance from gas to electric one system from gas to electric, or to change the electric panel. That's what's in their, their current proposed plan right now to help all of us get to the state mandated goals, right? So, so I, I wanna talk just for a second, um, if I may, to the panelists. Point of sale, um, at least from the realtor's perspective, is probably the least efficient way for any government to reach their goals. If, if the whole point of imposing point of sale is to make these goals happen, um, you know, from the realtor's perspective, for example, in Sacramento, we only had about 5% of our housing stock sell last year, right? So if we want to meet this goal, we want to meet this target to help our environment, which I think we're all on board with, right? No one's against, no one's here to ruin the environment. But if, if our whole point of doing this is to reach this goal, to reach this um, level of, of environmentally friendly living, it's going to take us 20 years at least to get all of that housing stock to that level, right? At least 20 years if you're looking at 5% each year. Now let's not talk about the fact that it's not a new 5% of homes. It's not like those, once you sold three years ago, you're not allowed to sell for another 15 years, right? We all know that doesn't happen with houses. So it's even gonna take longer than that, right? So from the realtor's perspective, if the whole point of mandating a change to a home is to reach a goal, that's probably the most inefficient way for the government to, to handle that, to reach their goal. Then let's go back to the fact that we are in a housing affordability crisis. And I'm kind of tired of that phrase because honestly, it's not strong enough. We, we, our housing is getting beyond expensive to where people cannot even fathom owning a home. You all know what it's like for your first time home buyers who can only afford 350 or 400 on the purchase price out there right now, and they're FHA with 3.5% down and no extra savings. How hard is it to get those people into homes? Okay, now let's talk about what does it mean when you have point of sale requirements for those escrows. So let's say, hey, because you're buying in the unincorporated area, you know, Sacramento County area, you have to change out that electric panel before you can close your escrow. So not only are they now coming in with their down payment, who knows what they're giving up even to get their offer accepted. Now they have to find another three to $5,000 to change out their electric panel just so they have the privilege of owning that home. It makes it more unaffordable. And it disproportionately impacts our neighborhoods who have the lower price points, right? Because whether it doesn't matter where you're buying your house, you're probably spending three to 5,000 to upgrade that panel. So if you're looking at a 350 price point versus a million dollar price point, who is that disproportionately impacting, right? That $3,500 is a lot more expensive for someone buying a $350,000 home than it is someone buying a million dollar home. So that's why from the realtor's perspective, we are constantly fighting against this idea of point of sale. Not only is it inefficient, but it, it, it has a, a terrible impact on those trying to own a home, those trying to sell a home. It might, it, let's just say they can find the money to meet the point of sale requirements, maybe, it still can completely blow up a deal over, maybe you can't even get it done in time. Who knows if the electrician's available, <laughs> right? So from our, point, from our perspective, realtors are always here um, to talk to our officials about why we think there are better ways to meet goals than point of sale. So the, all of that, sorry, that was a very long diatribe, but Todd, I do have a question for you out of all of that. You know, and, and taught, you know, our county has been great working with us. You know, we're all on the same team here. We're all in the same boat to meet these standards, right? But Todd, how it, can we as realtors, what is the best way for us to provide our feedback and our thoughts to the county um, on how to help 
implement that final version of the climate action plan that we will all be living under? Yeah, so I think one of the ways um, uh, that it would be most helpful is to help us understand uh, what it means. What what are the implications of this? And, and you've done a good job of hitting on a couple of those points. And I think the letter uh, that Aaron sent a couple of weeks ago also does that. Uh, we want to stay in communication with your group uh, as this moves forward. I think one of the ways, um, the other way that can be helpful is to try to formulate different ideas than we've heard before. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, we've got a lot of um, feedback from environmental groups, particularly around pushing for the full electrification. Uh, in order for us to meet our greenhouse gas reduction targets, we have to have something that's equivalent or some other mechanism that is going to be able to achieve those reductions uh, in a different way. And so one of the other earlier versions of the cap had a, a, um, a much stronger education campaign component around electrification, you know, trying to get the word out to uh, those existing residents, you know, trying to educate them on the various mechanisms and, and incentives that actually SMUD has a number of incentives uh, around this topic. Um, so to the extent that we can use the Realtors Association as a network to help educate the consumers, uh, for example, on the benefits of some of these measures, if it's not a point of sale, what's another way to do it? What's another mechanism? And something that um, was in the um, association's letter was a recommendation for um, at the end of the appliance life uh, was something that was an idea. And so we're exploring that. I think, Jennifer, you mentioned that that's something the city is also looking at as well. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Todd. We appreciate your engagement on that topic, and we know we'll, you know, continue to engage with you there. So thank you for that um, comment. We appreciate it. Um, since we're talking, since he brought up um, what's happening at the city, Jennifer, um, can you talk to us a little bit? We know the city is is starting the process of of electrification of existing housing stock. You've already set the policy for new housing stock starting in 2023 to be all electric, but we know you're now talking about. What happens to all the homes that are already here, already built? Can you talk to us about um, how how we can best be engaged in that process here as, as the real estate industry with the city? Absolutely. We have that planning effort, which will be kicking off within the next month or so. We're just at that point of developing a project schedule with the goal of completing a strategy by the end of next year. So to get there, we'll be pulling together stakeholders, some sort of working group, maybe thematic working groups, like there could be one on the real estate industry, for example, and still got to figure this out. But we invite and really look forward to the engagement of the association in that process at all phases to help us keep our eye on the prize and figure out how to get there together. So really welcome your engagement throughout the next year. And for folks here on the call or in the room with ideas, please just encourage you, you're welcome to reach out to us directly, work with Aaron and Kelly and just funnel that information to us because we will be very deliberate in engaging this group. And I'm just also gonna reiterate something that Todd just said is we really need your help to figure out how to get these new creative programs off the ground and helping staff, helping our decision makers understand various impacts of policies and ways we can go about it better is so helpful for us in this process and we need your support. I will also drop a, a link here into the chat for those on Zoom. If you wanna sign up just to keep an eye on updates on our planning process, we do have an email list. So please sign up. And as I said, we will be keeping Aaron and this group informed and happy to come back and share an update later throughout the year. Thank you, Jennifer. We, we definitely appreciate that. And thank you for providing the link. We'll make sure we can get that out to our membership so they can stay engaged as well. Um, you know, I do wanna touch on you know, a couple of the things that we talk about here at SAR about electrification and some of the concerns that we have, right? So 
So let's go back to everybody's favorite appliance, the gas stove, right? So we're, we're coming up with these ideas to require our homeowners and our consumers to move to electric, but they don't want to, right? The consumer demand by and large, not always, but right now the consumer demand by and large is for gas stoves in their kitchen. So I think we all need to start thinking about how do we shift that mentality? Because if we're gonna just force feed people something they don't want, it's not gonna work, right? We all know it. We have to, we have to think about what the, what the demand is coming from our consumers and from our homeowners and home buyers. Not to mention, how many of you have tried to order an appliance in the last year? Right? How long is it taking? Anybody? Six weeks, maybe? Six months sometimes? Right? And, and let's layer on top of that these specialty types of products. You know, if you're someone who, who does a really good job cooking in the kitchen, unlike myself, um, you know, and you're, you're, you're thinking about this idea, okay, maybe I'm going to do my part for the environment, right? I'm going to get rid of my gas, six burner gas range that I love to prepare these ex extravagant meals on. And I'm going to go to an induction, right? I'm going to go to an induction, electric induction range. These are, these are specialty types of products. And how many are there? And how, what does their availability look like, right? So we have to start thinking about if there's no supply of the appliances we're trying to push everybody into, then what do we do? We're, we're left stuck, especially if there is a mandated requirement to close that escrow before you get that appliance. If you can't get it, then what do you do, right? So these are concerns that we have here at SAR. And then, you know, I, I, you know we'll talk about this idea of, you know, um, switching out appliances when, when they go out, right? Let's talk about this idea of electrifying or requiring when it's time to replace an appliance. Now you have to go electric. Okay, let's, not a bad idea, but let's think through real life a little bit here. It's, it's thanks, night before Thanksgiving, you're cooking like crazy, you're running the dishwasher, you're doing a load of laundry, and your water heater stops working. Your gas water heater. Your family is now without hot water in your home. And you don't have the electric supply in your panel to support a tankless electric water heater. But you're required to move now from gas to electric. So now you have to get an electrician out to your house to upgrade your panel. You have to run a new line, a new electric line, so that you can replace your water heater. Then you have to get this new electric water heater installed. All this time without your family having hot water. Right? It's not realistic. That said, what can we do as an industry? I mean, we're out there on the field, right? We're talking with our clients and our consumers every single day about their homes and the systems in their homes, and we're inspecting these systems. How can we get the conversation moving around upgrading your panel or having the availability of the electricity in your home already so that if and when these things happen, you're already prepared? Right, you already have the option to move electric. And I think that's a conversation that we can have here at the association and with our, with our city and our county and SMUD is how can we start that conversation? How can we talk about electric preparedness of a home? That's where we think we need to start talking. Um, Steve, we haven't heard from you in just a bit, so let's give you a chance to chime in here as our local electric provider from SMUD. Um, the biggest question I think we get here at the association when we talk about going all electric is, can our grid handle it? Can we take on that capacity? We've all seen the brownouts happening um, during the summer. So can you touch on that a little bit, Steve? And, how, how, and if we do that, how realistic, I know you touched on this a little bit, but how realistic is it for SMUD to maintain low rates if we're, we have this excess demand for electricity? Yes, uh, we can handle the demand. And I, I want to get to that in a second. But just to follow up on a comment you just made uh, for the membership, I just wanted to go through sort of what our rebates are currently for uh, applying switch outs in case I don't have a chance to do it. Um, right now, our rebate is up to $2,500 if you go from gas to electric, uh, going to a heat pump hot water heater, up to $3,000 to go into a heat pump uh, HVAC system if you go from gas to electric. Uh, induction cooktops uh, are $750. And we have a home performance program that has rebates up to $13,500 if you sort of batch things together. 
And I just, you know, uh, if you go to smud.org, they have all this listed on there. I just want to touch on that in case I don't have a chance to get back to that uh, by the end of today. So the question was, you know, really, do we have the capacity if we go to an all electric environment? And yes, we do. You know, maintaining ele uh, reliable electric service is one of the core values for SMUD. And I, got, I want to respond in two different ways. One is sort of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, you know, we update our transmission and distribution system plans annually to make sure that our electrical grid continues to have capacity to serve our existing customers and future demand. Um, we, look at, we look at it one year out, five years out, and 10 years out by looking at customer demand, proposed new developments, and long range plans that are approved by our city and our county. We also use this to forecast our electrical load so we can plan on ensuring that we have adequate resources in the near term and the long term. As Californians, we know that there are some utilities that have had um, periods where the, there's been a, a brownout or there's been a, a public safety power shutoff due to weather or climate conditions. Um, but we also know that those haven't occurred in smud service territory. We take great pride in, in making sure we have adequate resources for all of our customers so we're not in a, a situation where we uh, have to have some of our customers go without power. And in fact, when the last series of brownouts went out, we shifted some of our load over to the ISO, which is the, the load balancing agency for the state, so that they had more resources for those areas uh, that were without resources. <clears throat> uh, the, here's, the, here's sort of the, the, the other side of it. You know, I'm in conversations a lot with folks and they say, you know, gosh, if, if SMUD's wires just, you know, colloquially, seems like they're, they're just not adequate. There's, there's problems with the wires. And how are you going to handle this? You have to remember you know, that SMUD, you know, or Sacramento, we have amazingly hot days. You know, our load for our customers in, in July on a 105 degree day is enormous compared to like a day like today in October that's beautiful outside, very low load. We're used to serving really large loads. And so if we're having a, a load that's increasing a little bit because of electrification, we can accommodate that. We're ready for it, we're planning for it, and we know that we have to move that direction uh, to address climate change um, as well as state and federal requirements. So Kelly, I'll just jump in really quickly. Go ahead, Jennifer. Follow up to Steve. Just wanna make sure folks here remember, we can take it for granted living in our region, but with SMUD, we really have the nation's leader in electrification and sustainability. And I just wanna commend SMUD and put that out there. Would really welcome ideas of what can we do to make sure your clients understand this and all of those rebates and programs Steve listed off. What are thoughts on how do we remove barriers to participation? And those are issues we'll work through on the strategy, but just for folks to know, like those rebates that we have from SMUD are not matched in other places. So that gives folks a unique opportunity here if they want to have that forward thinking, future proofed home of the future, which they cannot get uh, in just PGE territory, for example. Thanks, Jennifer. I could not I, have said that better myself, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, Jennifer. And I, I do want to just mention to uh, that. You know, our rates are among the lowest in California. We're about 36 and percent lower than PG&E. Uh, and so that's another benefit that you get by being in Sacramento County. Our board of directors just improved rate increases for next year, as well as 2023. Uh, it's one and a half percent next year and 2% in 2023. Both, as we know, we're far below the rate and anticipated rate of inflation. So we are focused on keeping our rates low for both residential and non-residential customers. Thank you, Steve. We appreciate you touching on those. I have I have one final question for the group, and um, Jennifer kind of just referenced it a little bit. But you know, when we look back in history, it, it's not an uncommon tale that when you, when we bring in new technologies to our world, it, it is often our underserved groups and neighborhoods who who miss out on that or get delayed in that implementation. So we'd like to know here at the association how each of your organizations are making sure that equity is a consideration um, as you roll out these new policies? And, and how are you ensuring that it's not gonna have a disproportionate impact um, on our underserved communities? So if you could just each touch on that in one or two minutes, we'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Real quickly from the city side, that's part of the reason we are even conducting this strategy for existing building electrification. The concern is that we know gas rates are going up, gas infrastructure is old, those rates are gonna pop up 
it's estimated to be more than tenfold over the next 20 years. So imagine that paying a couple hundred bucks for your gas bill every month instead of 20 in a normal month. So what that means is if we don't take action, the people left on the pipe are those that will be least able to pay. So for the city's strategy, equity is a big goal. We've also launched an environmental justice collaborative governance committee, and they've been involved in giving us guidance and input on the approach, selecting a consultant, and we'll be working with them as we move forward. So uh, for Sacramento County, um, similar type of process as it relates to environmental justice and, and the communities in Sacramento County that are disadvantaged. Um, we have adopted a couple years ago now the, the county's environmental justice element, which uh, contains a policy and it is the goal of our climate action plan as well to prioritize those investments uh, that are coming out as about a, as as relates to new technology or energy efficiency retrofits, uh, those sorts of things, in those uh, disadvantaged communities that we know are disproportionately affected by things like climate change. So whether that's you know energy efficiency upgrades, uh, whether that's electrification, whether that's um, enhanced tree plantings through a partnership with the Sacramento Tree Foundation, as an example, uh, those are the priority investments for Sacramento County. Thank you. Steve, do you have anything to add? Sure. At SMUD in 2018, when our board of directors adopted a, 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 a what was called an integrated resource plan, which was a precursor to our 2030 plan, we realized we were, we were going to be making a lot of uh, local or investments in uh, energy related uh, efforts, whether it's customer side or utility side. And so we established a sustainable communities department which is looking at trying to make sure that not only do we make our investments locally where possible because we want it to be an economic catalyst for our area, but also to make sure that we understand our customer base and want our programs to be ben to benefit all of our customers, not, this, not just the homeowners or not just market rate homeowners, but also low income residents who are maybe renters or, or low income uh, homeowners. And so I, you know, I, I rattled off a series of rebates that are available for market rate homeowners we have uh, other re rebates that are available for low-income uh, residents. In some, in some cases, the, the, the swap outs are free. The work is for low-income is making them go all electric right now so that they're not left behind and that they're being brought along at the same rate as the rest of Sacramento uh, in this endeavor. Fantastic. Thank you all um, for your input today. I, I want to make sure I give you at least like you know 30 seconds or a minute for any closing remarks. Should you have any that you want to make? Okay, thank you for your time today. Um, you guys, oh, someone's speaking up. Sorry, that was, that was me. I couldn't unmute quickly enough. Just no wanna thank everyone again, and we're really excited. We have the will, the partnerships here, and we're excited to figure out these programs and get it right with you all, so thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. We, we appreciate it. We, we look forward to staying engaged with each of you as we all move forward together in this world toward more electricity in our lives. So thank you for your conversation today. We appreciate your time. All right, let's give him a hand. Thank you so much.